Your Highness, you're the Imam of the Shia Imami Ismaili Muslims. Uh, it's a hereditary title. That, have you ever felt burdened uh, by being sort of, you know, you're the 49th hereditary Imam, uh, you, you're a direct descendant from the Prophet, you became the Imam at the age of 20. Did it ever come up for you? Were you a reluctant Imam in any way? <laughs> you know, uh, a hereditary office is, is a hereditary office and every member of the family has known that, uh, so that concept of burden isn't there. Uh, the concept of opportunity, yes. Uh, it is a very special opportunity to be able to serve uh, a community which I would define as an admirable community, uh, widely spread internationally, and uh, succeeding a man like my grandfather, who was, a, I think, a rather unique leader. You work uh, out of France and, 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 and half an hour from Paris. Uh, where is a sense of home for you? Uh, where do you feel anchored? Well, I've had a strange life because I was... Uh, uh, my early childhood was in Kenya. Then my education was in Switzerland, the United States. Then I returned to Switzerland after... I finished my education, then I established myself in France. So, in terms of work, the work happens wherever I am. And as I travel a minimum of four months a year, and probably more than that, the work is where I am. I suppose the children would consider France as their, their base. Uh, they've spent more of their lives there than elsewhere. So in that sense, yes, I suppose that would be the, the home. Your, your interests are diverse. Uh, uh, I think many of us are familiar with your initiatives in, in development yes, support, yes, yes. Uh, but you've also, you breed thoroughbreds, you have yes. an interest in tourism, yes. a whole range of interests. Yes. Isn't that sort of an unlikely profile <laughs> for an imam? I think that may come from a non-Muslim perception rather than a Muslim perception. I think that uh, in Islam, right from the time of Prophet Muhammad, there has been uh, a compatibility between the faith and the world in which the faith is practiced at any given time. And I'm not willing to make any compromise on that compatibility. I'm not willing to accept that uh, other notions of the relationship between the world and faith should be imposed on an, uh, a Muslim or a, an Islamic interpretation. So I have no discomfort. On the contrary, I have very great conviction in it. And uh, I believe that most Muslims uh, have that and believe in that compatibility. Indeed, probably the most common statement about Islam is that it is a way of life. It's not just a faith, it is a way of life. I inherited, effectively, things from my family, which, for one reason or another, I've continued to, to carry on, such as the thoroughbred activities, such as personal investments. But I have no no discomfort with any perceived dichotomy, very much the contrary. Are you despairing of, of, of the turmoil that much of Islam seems to be in? The world is very much influenced by the way a faith or a community uh, communicates. And I think that uh, there is there a very great gap. The vast majority of Muslims today live in a rural environment. They do not communicate. They are peaceful people. Uh, the perceptions that one has of polarization and things of that sort are much more urban forces, urban expressions. And if you were to ask me today whether the vast majority of the Muslims participated in any way in this polarization, I would answer probably not. Your efforts and initiatives uh, in, in the areas of development yes. have been unique uh, well, uh, in, in the context of the, their secularism, in yes. a sense, yes. uh, that you employ people of all communities, nationalities, and, yes. and many of your development initiatives uh, reach out to people of all faiths and yes. backgrounds. Yes. Where did the impetus for that, that worldview come from for you? Essentially in my belief in the message of Islam, which is that uh, you uh, must not uh, 
impede or damage or do anything to hurt the people amongst which you live. On the contrary, you seek to build uh, relations with them and uphold uh, their quality of life. And indeed, uh, you, you mentioned just now this issue of polarization. Uh, one of the ways to polarize societies is to divide them. And uh, I think that on the contrary, anything that can be done to bring them together uh, to develop common objectives uh, in improving their quality of life is perfectly acceptable. That doesn't mean that individuals don't practice their faith. That is their right. There is the perception that, uh, that, that sections of Islam are, uh, let's say, intolerant of, mm. of other faiths. Uh, we've already talked about your, your essentially yes. secular yes. Uh, approach and philosophy. Yes. What is the Islamic position on, on other faiths and relation, relationships with other faiths? Well, I think uh, we, we are experiencing a time of, uh, in a sense, the search for a, a legitimacy in the interpretation of Islam in relation to the modern world, in relation to modern society, in relation to non-Muslim societies. And uh, in that search, there are all sorts of interpretations uh, being put forward. Uh, I personally am very cautious about seeking uh, a, a formalistic approach because I think that one of the great risks, apart from the fact that it does tend to deny individuality, which is of course something strongly upheld in the Islamic faith, is the fact that uh, it tends to anchor a faith in one time. And that is one aspect which of, of, of my faith which I would never accept. I would never accept that uh, the concept of Islam, the practice of Islam, cannot be fulfilled uh, in, in, a, in the modern world or in the world of tomorrow. The other philosophical uh, dimension that, that an Islamic mm. worldview um, must come up for you in mm. some measure mm. is, in, is in, in, in the development models mm. uh, that, that you might be seeking to encourage. Yes. Uh, I think sort of the uh, Islam decrees a societal framework yes. which, which may seem sort of somewhat strained yes. in relationship to modern technology, modern practices, structures, yes. financial institutions. Uh, how have you reconciled those? Well, I, <laughs> I, I say this with, with deference, but I'm not entirely convinced that the faith itself has decreed any particular form rather than the people who have interpreted it. And uh, if my role is to interpret the faith in regard to modern society, I have to look at the basic issue, which is whether anything that we are doing is in conflict with the ethic of Islam. If it is not in conflict with the ethic of Islam, then I must interpret it as being possible. Mm -hmm. uh, spirituality or religion or the mm -hmm. faith is, is, is frequently threatened by technology. Mm -hmm. You have a, a, a passion and a great interest in technology. Mm -hmm. have, how have you managed to reconcile that? Or Well, from the moment that, that I am not willing to say that the faith of Islam is of a particular time. Then I have to search within Islam what are the elements which allow me to interpret within the modern world. And my interpretation is that Allah's message and his power is not limited. And in fact that modern science simply allows us to discover more and more of the miracles that he has performed, perhaps continues to perform. And uh, we are blessed with the faculty of intelligence. And I cannot understand why we would be blessed with that faculty unless we were mandated to use it. Mm -hmm. I think there is an anxiety in, in many developing societies, mm -hmm. including India, that uh, modernization has frequently meant westernization. Yes. Uh, that, that technology has meant uh, a sense of alienation from the community, from, yes. from, from, from one's immediate environment, yes. a disintegration of the family, yes. etc., etc. When you go in with, with, with development strategies and yes. development models, uh, is there an, an overview of an ideal society that you seek to perpetuate or encourage? 
No. There's no, there's no, I, there's no to total view in my, in my uh, perception, simply because I view diversity as strength, and that may be a, a funny <laughs> statement to make. But I think that uh, in diversity there is great strength if it is understood that diversity must not be encouraged to become conflict. But the different cultures, different faiths, different languages, different traditions should be looking at common issues and starting from different standpoints but trying to resolve them collaboratively. That is a major force. And it is only divisive it is, if it is to have turned into something divisive. Otherwise, it's very, it's very powerful. I am personally concerned about uh, a, culture, a, a loss of cultural tradition. And uh, I would like to see cultural tradition enhanced. But it doesn't have to be at the exclusion of others. What it means is that a cultural tradition is a, is a human inheritance in a given society. Let that be continued and enhanced. Uh, I'm, I'm still looking for um, an articulation of, of, of your relationship with other faiths mm -hmm. uh, and, and the philosophical premise of, uh, of Islam mm -hmm. in its relationship mm -hmm. to other religions and, and communities. Mm -hmm. uh, I accept uh, unequivocally your own sort of secular worldview as manifest in, in the initiatives mm. and actions that mm. you've taken? Well, you know, if you look at the premises of the Islamic environment, of the physical environment, they are in no way conflictual or contradictory to other faiths. Uh, and in fact, I think they are just as appreciated by other faiths as by our own. So I have no discomfort there. On the contrary, I feel that uh, if others uh, share the appreciation that we have of, of, of the environment that is created, let that be. I'm very happy. Mm -hmm. What would you say uh, for, 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 for the world community moving into the 21st mm -hmm. century, what are the overriding concerns and problems that, that, that worry you? A number of them. I think one of the biggest worries I have is how to give, how to encourage a sense of quality of life in the rural areas. To understand what rural populations are seeking and to try and convince them that the development process is concerned about them and that it will address their issues in their own language, in their own vocabulary. Because I cannot visualize uh, the massive rural populations of the developing world ever becoming urbanized without cataclysmic consequences. Uh, in Western societies that's happened, but demography is stable or receding. Uh, so that is one of, my, one of my concerns. Another one of my concerns is the stabilization of the economies of the developing world. That is, economies which are basically dependent on one or two resources, how do, you, how do you take steps to avoid the volatility of that situation? Because you cannot have a stable development process in a volatile environment. And there are a large number of countries which are dependent on that. A third area is clearly how to deal with new forms of disease. Uh, disease of the... Uh, modern society, if you want. That is something which is calling for enormous resources today. Developing countries don't have those sort of resources. How do they enable their population to access to that sort of care? That's another area. Obviously, there are political concerns there are, and, and, and those sort of issues, but I'm not a politician. But insofar as there is the beginning of a of a cooling down of the conflictuality which existed between power blocks in the past. That I can only commend those who are making it happen and, 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 and wish and pray that that should continue because I think that will be a major force for, for improvement in quality of life. You've said you're, you're not a politician. What kind of role do you see for yourself beyond the context of being the imam for your community? 
Well, I would, I would like to be able to convince people that they can work towards common objectives, no matter what backgrounds they come from, in language, in faith, in society. That one doesn't have to give up one's heritage or one's individuality or one's faith. To set and achieve common goals, so long as they are well determined and shared. And if that can happen in the developing world, and certainly not through my input only, but to me it would be a substantial achievement because it would be convincing people from different backgrounds, different societies, that their differences are not weakness and they do not have to be translated into conflict. They can be translated into immense strength and benefit for everybody. Uh, where might the, the impetus, the catalyst for change come from? Uh, one solution would be for there to be a lot many Aga Khans. In, in <laughs> but uh, do you see hope in those kinds of initiatives? Are there many people like yourself who are doing that outside the formal structures of government? Yes, I, I, am, I am reasonably confident. And I'm reasonably confident for a number of, of, of hope, I hope, uh, true, true um, causes. Think of the world of the late 50s and the early 60s. A number of countries were termed basket cases. A number of statements were made that developing countries could never feed themselves. A number of country, a number of statements were made that democracy couldn't survive. And I remember those statements. And I think that they have been flawed in a number of areas of the world. Not only have they been flawed, but I suspect that as time evolves, we will find that they have been definitively flawed. If that is the case, something has been achieved. It may have cost an immense amount in, in, in difficulty, in resources, in, in objectives which have not been fulfilled. But some very real basic objectives have been fulfilled. So I'm not willing to say that no progress has been made. What I do believe is that there is another force working for us today, which is the force of communication. Uh, people from around the world are dialoguing much more before than ever before. And I have the impression that to articulate issues in a wider forum, share the difficulties of addressing them, is a major force for the good. Even if the solution isn't found today, the fact that the visualization of the problem is shared is already an immense step. And when I look at the international agencies working in the development field, in my language, they are infinitely better qualified in 1989 than they were in the 1950s, at least to understand in the language of the developing world what are its concerns. And the Rural Support Program, which I'm involved with, is doing exactly that at the micro level. It is dialoguing with people. Forgive the, uh, the, the irreverence of the question, <laughs> but where do you get the, the funds for from your, uh, from your business interests, from your personal uh, assets, yes. for the development initiatives that you've supported? Well, we have, we have probably four types of, of resources. There are the institutional resources of the community, which the uh, community makes available to the imam. There are the secular resources which the community institutions develop. There are external resources from grants which uh, institutions give us, governments, development agencies, etc. And then there are my own personal resources which I have from my family and which I use as I see appropriate. And uh, so long as the principles of propriety are respected, those resources are all used. What has been your relationship in, with, with the government of India and then the projects in India? You moved in here in the late 70s yes, substantially. Yes. Well, it's been one of uh, very great constructive collaboration. Uh, 
I would qualify it as exciting collaboration because I think that uh, India being a secular state, uh, some of the difficulties that other societies have in dealing with a multicultural or a multi-faith approach uh, have been less acute. Uh, and I think the Indian government in the past and today, more and more, is looking at effectiveness, is seeking effectiveness, prizes effectiveness, and if institutions with which I am connected can be effective, then our collaboration should, should grow. What are some of the major initiatives that you have, that you have launched in India and plan in the immediate future? Well, they have been, as, as you can imagine, in rural development, in primary health care, in uh, preschool education. In other words, those aspects which affect isolated or poor communities. Now, those communities occur in two circumstances. They occur in the rural areas, but they also occur in the peri-urban areas, newly urbanized populations. And those are programs which you're working on. A second area has been to enhance institutions whose uh, vision of life, maybe in the 50s, needed uh, encouraging and, 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 and widening, and that has occurred and in resource mobilization, in things like banking, etc., we are working because if that isn't a clear objective, the needs grow and the resources don't follow. And that, of course, is something which nobody can govern. Have you come up any sort of, uh, against any resistance or optical obstacles, not just in India, but, but in yes. your work, uh, yes. The fact that, that, that you represent uh, a faith and yes. that you're an imam, is, is that...? Yes. Oh, I'm sure there are uh, visions of who I am and what I do which are not uh, always uh, favorable. But um, I think there's one thing in, in leadership that every leader has to accept. There's never going to be consensus on leadership. There's always going to be differences of opinion. Um, the concept of leadership by referendum is not necessarily the right decision. <laughs> I think uh, the role of leadership is uh, to have the courage to live by certain objectives, certain standards. If they are challenged, let them be challenged. What is sort of the agenda for the, for the rest of your life, if that isn't too tall a <laughs> question? <laughs> perhaps to leave a strengthened community in a more peaceful and uh, happy environment, and to contribute to uh, establishing certain ways of doing things, because uh, I had the good fortune of a good education. And, and I hope that that good fortune will be shared by more and more people. And. Uh, after all, everyone's life is a passage and um, perhaps the most one can do is to have left something behind during that passage which contributes and assists people to look to their future with more confidence and more stability, more hope. Is there a conscious process in the grooming of your children in, in the tradition of service? Your Grandfather was president of the League of Nations. You had an yes. uncle who was the United Nations High Commissioner for yes. Refugees. There have been, uh, yes. Your father was an, was an ambassador yes. to the United Nations. It's been yes. a long tradition. Yes. Uh, is there a conscious process? Well, my daughter is, is 18. My eldest son is 17. The second son is 15. They are still in a formal educational process. And at this point in their lives, I feel it's appropriate that they should stay in that process. I hope they will be successful in their educational work, and if they are, then later on uh, they will hopefully be associated with various areas of my work, learn about it, they, they have indicated their interest. But I think at that young age it's probably premature to say to them, uh, you must participate in a formalized uh, uh, training, it's, it's probably not right. Well, we, we, are you aware, do you, do you have any recollections of any sort of uh, 
uh, the elements that, 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 that made up your own grooming, so that when you did take over at, at the age of 20, you almost hit the ground running. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, in, in my case, uh, uh, my grandfather made his choice, and it was communicated at the time of his death. So, uh, my interests uh, did evolve between uh, the time that I started my education and, and, and becoming the Imam. I suspect that will always happen. Because being a hereditary uh, office, uh, the, 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 the succeeding Imam does not know at what age he will inherit, uh, what will be the state of the world in which he will live. Uh, certainly, if he has been exposed to uh, the activities that are there, he will be hopefully in a position to take on the work in, a, in, a, in an appropriate manner. Uh, I was very fortunate in the sense that I was interested in two areas. Uh, as a person, I was interested in science, and therefore in the world around me, and I was interested in the history of Islam, therefore of my faith. And those were intrinsic to me. They weren't uh, asked for or imposed in any way by my family. Have you ever had trouble reconciling sort of with your Western education, and, and you've talked about the upholding of democratic values, uh, democracy and a hereditary title? Has that ever come up for you? None whatsoever. It's never been a, a problem in the sense that this is a religious function. Uh, the premises on which it exists and has been established and legitimized other and uh, I have no problems with it so long as the institution does not uh, affect the secular freedoms of the community and uh, I don't think it certainly in my lifetime I have thought that that should never be the case. What is the premise of a hereditary title? Well as you know uh, the uh, prophet uh, indicated that he wished Hazrat Ali to become the, the guide uh, for the uh, Muslims. This is not an interpretation shared by all, but it is the interpretation of the Shia Muslims. And from there, the succession has been established. So I don't think on that issue I have any qualms. Um, I have been careful not to let the practice of the faith uh, in any way affect or impede the secular rights of the community. And that's why, uh, one of the reasons why I have not wanted to accept any form of international commitment of any sort, because it would expose me to political pressures, to political involvement. And uh, I don't think in today's world that would be compatible with my work, with my role. Uh, what future role do you see for the, for the Imams in, in, in the changing world and in, in, in the generations to come? Do you see that changing in any way? Well, as, as you will have uh, known, I uh, tried to, have tried to continue the work that um, my grandfather did. He had a clear vision of his role in his time. I hope I have a clear vision of my role in my time. And that vision will have to be defined by the Imam. Uh, that is, in fact, the premise of Imamat uh, in, our, in our interpretation. That is, that it is the Imam who interprets in accordance with his time. And uh, that is his absolute prerogative, uh, his right, his duty. So uh, I wouldn't go further than that. <laughs>